Welcome to True Vine Talks with Rachel and Linda on this Friday morning, spring. How are you, Rachel? I'm doing well. Yeah. How are you, Linda? We'll figure it out later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How's the sound with my microphone? I, th I think it's the same. I think are we just going to have to... Uh, yeah. Cool. Like it as is. Awesome. So Rachel and I were processing prior to starting our podcast about, you know, questions that come up in couples therapy. Um, what to expect when you pursue couples therapy, marriage counseling of that nature. And we'd like to just kind of do like a little podcast on what to expect when you come for couples therapy with true vine counseling so yeah I think people don't know what to expect and a lot of times it's their first experience with mental health care they've never been to individual therapy and they're showing up with their partner uh, you know in distress a lot of times you're, the couples are kind of in crisis and um, just don't really know how it's going to work, what to expect, what's going to be expected of them. Yes. And, and, you know, if it's your first rodeo in therapy, um, couples therapy can be less anxious because you have a familiar other sitting beside you, you know, now, if you two are in distress and you've been fighting all week, you may find that it's more stressful to come into a counselor's office. Mm -hmm. But hey, isn't that the point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let me start by asking you this. Put Please you on do. the spot, Linda. What do you think are some of the kind of like good signs like as a therapist what are some things that you pick up on between couples that you're like this I see this working this is good we can build off of this does that make sense oh yes um some good signs I'm trying to be close enough to the mic so folks can hear me some good signs are regard for each other um, if they display kindness, concern, genuine care, mm -hmm. they admire something about the other person, their work ethic, their parenting. I know then when they come into the room, we got something to work with here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some level of warmth underneath the conflict right you can tell that there's love there there's mm -hmm. still a bond between the two yeah yeah so those couples are good candidates for emotionally focused therapy because the cycle they've gotten into uh, the negative interactions um we can work from their inner warmth and try to make sense of what triggered their cycle. Often couples, if you've been together for a long time, you've hurt each other. Yeah, and we call happens. that, oh, go ahead, Miss Rachel. I was just validating what you were saying. I said, yeah, it happens. And we call it, um, Sue Johnson tells us that it's called an attachment injury. So I felt safe with you. I felt like you were there for me. But when you, when you didn't ask me and you left for that weekend for that golf, golf tournament, and I was here and had a sick child, that hurt me. And I don't feel the same. Mm -hmm. or um you bought a boat didn't ask me and it put us under financial strain um 
You ignored me when I needed you the most. I mean, it's just little things that can yeah. hurt your relationship. Have you noticed that, Rachel, that people aren't really mindful? Oh, when I did A, that made them feel B. Yes. Yeah. It seems like a very little thing, right, to the, to the person that did it and to an outsider. Of, you know, it might seem like a really little thing as well right? But us being emotionally focused therapists, we could pick up on that sense of betrayal, Mm -hmm. right? That this partner is feeling, you know, I had all of my trust and faith in you. I thought that you were always going to be there for you, for me. And you abandoned me in this time of need. That's how it feels to them. Well stated, Rachel, abandoned. And what happens to the human when they feel abandoned or alone? It's incredibly emotionally painful. Mm-hmm. You know, we start to wonder, am I enough? Do you really care about me? Can I trust anyone? All those attachment questions. Do I matter to you? Mm-hmm. Like you said, yeah. Do you care about me? Where are you? In the case where, you know, someone will leave you for a golf tournament on your anniversary, (laughs) well, maybe to them, they didn't think, oh, this might have, this might hurt my partner if I'm not here. No, they're thinking I've worked hard all week and I'm tired and I need a break, a mental health break. They're not checking in with their partner to see, hey, what would that be like for you if I went somewhere? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very, very rarely the other partner's intent to hurt. Mm, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, very rarely. It's usually something that they've done that was not intended to, to be hurtful. Yeah. That's good. That's very good because intention, how can anyone read someone else's intention? Yeah, we can't, right? No, you can't and, know what their yeah. intentions are. That's in the um, in another book I've been reading about. It's like when I have a difficult conversation, you know, and you think you're right and I think I'm right. Well, I'm going to think you have maleficent. Is that the right word? Intentions mm-hmm. when you left me for that tournament or, you know, golfing event on our anniversary. Well, you just don't care. And you did that mm-hmm. because you mad at me because I didn't make dinner or something. Maybe, maybe don't make dinner. I don't make dinner, you know, or, you know, you weren't hugging. A lot of them. times, yeah, yeah, it's perceived as uh, the partner being selfish. Yes. Caring more about themselves than me, you know. Hey, and we're all, that's one thing people don't like to admit. We all have some level of selfishness with, you know, we all have some level of selfishness and because we all have needs and we're all trying to get those needs met. Exactly. Yeah. So when they, you know, they abandon you for the golf tournament, I keep using this. Is this a good uh, example? I don't know. I'm just putting it on my yeah why not just come up with it is like well you weren't at their office that week you didn't experience the yelling boss the yelling patient or client or you know or you know your boss told you if you didn't get your numbers up you're gonna lose your job I mean you don't know what they went through Mm -hmm. that week and they talk about having a learning conversation in you know so what, what made you go on this golf tournament and not, not even mention this to me or, you know, what was going on for you that week? Yeah. yeah. Or here's a surprisingly common one. Would it be okay for me to share? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. When you accepted that job in another state, it felt like you or leaving me. Mm-hmm. 
That's good. Yeah. So sometimes our employment might take us to a new location and that could feel like abandonment. Mm -hmm. And so that wasn't really the intention. It was no. how do I gain employment to make more money yeah. to pay the bills? The intent, yeah, is how do I take care of this family or how do I gain a sense of purpose and achievement for myself? Yeah. Mm. It's good. So th those are those like um those are those attachment injuries that often you know couples come in with um sometimes there are affairs physical affairs emotional affairs and the couple wants to make sense of why would you look to someone else what was wrong with me how come you pursued that and i'm right here so that's that's a huge attachment injury in relationship. Yeah. And so one thing that we're priority always doing as the couples therapist is we're looking for what we call the cycle mm. that the couple's getting into, right? Mm -hmm. The more, the more, the more the more you pursue your partner for closeness and connection, right? Which may look like anger and criticism, the more your partner withdraws, mm -hmm. right? The more your partner withdraws, the more that scares you, right? We're, we're tracking this cycle. What is happening below the surface? right? Underneath what someone would see if they were watching this argument, okay? What we are not ever doing is trying to place blame, right? I think that that comes up a lot. Like, it, it's hard to acknowledge your own part of the cycle. And it's very, you know, very common to want to, like, point fingers at one another, very well stated, Rachel. And in that, when you come to us for couples therapy, I would I would put my ego at the door, do a self check. Okay, I'm here to learn how to get closer. I the the human complex is we think we're right. Yeah, <laughs> called the right reflex in psychology. We all believe we're right about all things. We believe we know better than all everyone else. They called it the right reflex syndrome. So when you come to couples therapy, you're putting the right hand down and you're just saying, open hands, teach me therapist, how do I get out of this negative cycle? So coming to couples therapy or family therapy is very humbling because you have contribution to the negative cycle. Yeah, I so your couples therapist, or at least I can speak, I think for Linda and I, an emotionally focused therapy is not going to tell you who's right and who's wrong. Nope. We are not going to give you relationship advice. Nope. Um, we are not going to tell you whether this relationship is going to make it or not. Nope. <laughs> you know, whether to get a divorce or stay together, not going to do that. Nope. Uh, what else are we not going to do that people might be confused about? You oh. got them all. Oh, did We're you not? I just thought of another one. We're not going to like tell you how to compromise on like the, the specific conflicts you're having, like whether to buy a new car or not. Like we're not gonna yeah. yeah that's all content yes so you know we're not we can get into your content okay so we got in an argument because you didn't pay a bill on time and I got a big late fee okay so what happened 
when your partner didn't pay the bill on time? Well, I felt pissed because that bill needed to be paid and I asked them specifically to do that. And now I'm paying a $50 late fee, which we don't have in our budget. Mm -hmm. That's a common conflict. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So underneath that, when your partner didn't pay the bill, what did you feel? This is a hard one for folks. Yeah. What did I feel angry? Yeah, on the surface, you felt angry and you're protesting. But underneath the anger, you felt what? Hurt, sad. What did you feel underneath? And what do we find that's happening underneath typically in that scenario, Rachel? Didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, that's okay. I, I think it's typically in most situations, it's a either hurt or fear. I'm afraid you're never going to help me and I'm in this alone and that hurts to not be, to not, uh, you know, have this partner, not have this teammate that I thought that I had, right? I feel abandoned by you. Very well said. If I'm, if I'm in this alone and I can't lean on you or depend on you, what am I doing? Yeah. So I'm going to withdraw and we'll do it all myself mm -hmm. because I'm going to wear myself out. I'm going to do all the things. So I don't have a partner here. I'm alone. And I get this question a lot. If I'm already doing everything alone, why am I in this bond? Why am I here? But what they're really saying is, could you come close? Can I depend on you? Can I lean on you to be there for me when I need you to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we talk a lot about fears and longings being opposite sides of the same coin, right? And so when we, when we understand that fear, I'm afraid that I'm in this alone and it feels pointless, we flip it. It's called a reframe, right? We say, mm -hmm. what I want the most is to know that you're going to be beside of me, that you're going to hold my hand and we are walking this life together. That's what I want the most. Know that you're there for me and you're going to help. What happens when a human feels a secure, safe place to go away from the world? They can fly. Oh, yeah. And I'm thinking of the eagle, mm, <laughs> you know, the of eagle course, yeah. pushes her babies out, watches them fall, and then she swoops in and she picks them up before they fall, puts them oh, back wow. in the nest, gives them some food, and she kicks them out the nest. <laughs> 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 but, but they know, what do the eaglets know? that mom's going to catch me. I have a safe place mm -hmm. to fly, to learn how to fly. Yeah. That's why long-term monogamous bonds to people creates strong, healthy, successful individuals. I, I, I think that's because there's a safe, secure person. And if you haven't had that in life, that's not your fault. That's not your fault. If you didn't meet the right person and they weren't a secure, safe person to be there for you, that's not your fault either. And it didn't work out. That's okay. It doesn't always work out because you got to work through your own attachment issues from childhood and create a safe, secure attachment style within in order to be a secure attachment for someone else in life, or you can do it together. You can learn how to be secure together. Mm -hmm. I love those couples where we create that eaglet nest for each other. And yeah, I love those eagles. Yeah. What are some of the biggest um, red flags, right? Like now this doesn't mean that 
this couple is like doomed and they're never going to make it. Right. But what are some things that right away were like, Ooh, we've got to try to stop this or we've got to recognize this and work on it ASAP. Yeah, so um, um, if there is an addiction to pornography, alcohol, drugs, um, extra sexual curricular activities outside the relationship. Um, now, if you are polyamorous and all the parties are aware and you all are all doing what you're doing and everybody's in agreement and there's safety, consent, all that great things, that's an open relationship and that's different from a secure yeah. attachment style with a monogamous bond so if that's what you want to do that's great you can do that go for it and if you're in a secure attachment style or you're wanting to have one partner for life that's that's cool too so um you know, you still gotta be cautious, you know? And so if, you know, there's addiction or extra curricular activities that you both didn't agree upon, then sometimes that creates communication or some jealousy or insecurity or is that the right language? I'm using the right language, Rachel. Yeah. It's like anytime there's a, a uh, additional party brought into the relationship that it's in between you know that could be um an affair or an addiction right because addiction gets in the middle you know addiction's tough yeah and you know if you do have a sex addiction there are therapists out there angie juniper is the best in our area she's the one who has all that training so you know you might want to pursue that particular therapy for that that addiction so you know that's always good too so um you when you're attached to a substance or pornography it's hard to you're getting those needs met with that that attachment it's hard for you to come back to your partner and really be present for them is that is that sound right does that lean on you correct Rachel yes yes it does yeah because it's any it's these things that are actively preventing this relationship from having safety safety is our number one concern when we're starting to work with couples right and so if there is an active addiction if there is an ongoing unwanted affair or if there is any type of physical abuse, domestic violence happening, I think those are the top three things that we're like, we, we cannot start couples therapy until this is done. This has to stop. Yes. And we refer you out if you have an addiction yeah. of some type or, you know, we encourage individual therapy with one of our therapists, you or Caitlin or myself because maybe you need to work on inner child and you know there are the 12 steps out there of AA there's NA narcotics anonymous um when we had Josh on here he talked about those programs now he was a great guest yeah it's a great guest love it Mm -hmm. so yeah it's um you need to get your own treatment for addiction if it's active. So what Rachel's saying is true because that's going to get in the way of creating a safe, secure relationship. And it's a lot of work, guys. I mean, I just want to level with you. If you're trying to, you know, get it right for your partner, there's a lot of like reflecting in the mirror. Like it's, yeah. Wouldn't you it's say, not Rachel? A, yeah, this couple therapy is not a quick fix Mm-mm. it's not a quick fix it's not a band-aid it takes a lot of time 
right? And I know people probably hear that and they probably go, yeah, well, of course you want it to take a long time. You're making money off of it. Yeah, this is our business. We make money. We got to pay the bills, but we also have a wait list and we would love to help as many people as possible. So we, we want to get you in the door, talk to you, figure out what's going on, help you as smoothly and quickly as possible and get the next couple or individual in or family. You know, there's a lot of people that need help, but we're being transparency builds trust. That's like one of our mottos at Truevine. And you put that on the website, right? We're being honest yeah. that this is this is not going to be a like four meetings and we're done and our problems are resolved. This is gonna take time and effort from everybody involved. You cannot show up and say this isn't a me problem. This is a them problem. Well, Everybody I, has to be open to acknowledging their part in the cycle because it takes two to tango. Well stated. And contribution, if you can't look at how you're contributing to negative interactions within a family or within a partner, then you're, you're just looking for someone to blame and we all would love to blame, <laughs> we would love to defer responsibility, defer responsibility. That doesn't work in couples therapy. No. Oh, yes, I did hide out in my basement when you were on my case for not cleaning the floor. Or, you know, I didn't take out the trash or, you know, I didn't put the toothpaste away or, you know, just common nonsensical things that wouldn't matter if you felt close to your partner yeah 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 so so if you're coming to to true vine we love love helping see couples do a different dance together and tango and it's our goal to see you thrive and create that secure nest for each other to launch and be your best you, you can be. Yeah, yeah. We wanna help you get to the, the vulnerable, right? Like meaningful root of what is really going on, mm -hmm. right? And that for a lot of people feels very awkward and clumsy being vulnerable. It's really scary. I tell people, because yeah. people ask like, what, what do you mean by vulnerable? You know, hmm, um, what question. is, what does that look like? What does that sound like? No. And I had one person, this was an incredible image that someone shared when I asked, I, I kind of reflected it back. What do you think of when I say that word? And they said, I think of handing someone a knife, turning around and saying, don't stab me. Whoa. I know. I, I got chills. I, I was like, yeah, vulnerability includes a risk. We're taking a huge risk when we're being vulnerable. Well stated. I love their analogy in the that was great the imagery. It? Yeah. Gosh, huge risk there. Trust. Yeah. And then the next question as the therapist would be, okay. So when you were a kid, someone stabbed you in the back. Yeah. That would be the next question. And then we get into the inner child stuff, which we've done a podcast on. So Rachel and I just felt really like it was on our hearts today to try to, you know, communicate what it is that we, what to expect when you come to us for couples therapy. And, you know, if you've been married 30 years, there's a lot of hurt. <laughs> there's a lot of injuries along the way and so expecting three sessions to get through all of that because we're just it's an experiential therapy oh my goodness when she just said that you you didn't even look at her and notice her when she got dressed up what just happened just now you know you're in the room with them 
and you're noticing things as a therapist, mm -hmm. not just what the content was that brought them there. How are they interacting in our room? Yeah. We're going below the surface level, right? As a therapist, we are going to teach you how to track what's happening within yourself and within your partner, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're going to ask, what do you notice about your partner when it feels like they're upset with you? Well, I noticed that, you know, they're, they, their eyebrows kind of scrunch up and they look irritated. Okay. Right. And then we go to the partner when that happens, how are you really feeling? I'm feeling, we find out, you know, what looks like anger is actually hurt. Right. And they feel like they need to defend themselves. Right. Wow. What's it like to feel like that she's not actually mad at you. She's actually feeling hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. So before, when you thought she was angry, I'm just using she, because that's just what came to my mind right now, but, um, you know, thought they were angry and you would withdraw, you would go take a nap because you felt helpless. You didn't know what to do. What do you want to do now? Knowing that they're hurt, right? We're changing the cycle. We're getting an understanding of what's really happening mm -hmm. between right individuals and, and we're helping people learn how to communicate at a deeper level, how to really share what's happening in the, in the moment. Good, Rachel. Yeah. You feel scared when, when they, they're not there for you, or you feel scared when they go quiet, or you feel scared when they get mad. Like you said, like when we're noticing yeah. in the room and yeah. folks are like, Oh, she is what? she is getting guarded or he's mm -hmm. getting guarded over there. Yeah. I just feel tense when she starts to go on and on and says the same thing over and over. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, you tense up. How come? Well, because when I was a kid, my dad would yell at me and it feels the same, even though it's not. Yeah. There's just people don't, we're so complex, Rachel. Aren't so humans complex. complex? Oh my goodness incredibly complex yeah it's layers right that's why it takes such a long time like i i wish there was a fast forward or or like an easy button that's we're so incredibly complex and we've got you know linda and i work with dyads right two people at a time and so it's like you've got two entire lifetimes mm -hmm. you know like each person is, is bringing to the table everything that they've experienced since birth. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and we're trying to unpack that. How yeah. many experiences does an individual have in a lifetime? I don't know. Is there an answer to that? <laughs> Google it, somebody. Google it. How many? Well, you've got your experience with your biological caregivers. Right. Which is at least one or two. Right. And then you've got uh, potentially school experiences. If you were bullied or ever felt betrayed by a friend. Right. And then you've got previous relationship history. If you were ever in a, had a bad breakup or were ever cheated on by someone before your current mm -hmm. partner ever lost a, a previous partner, right? If you were, uh, you know, a widow or, you know, something. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got, you know, your experiences with your current partner. Mm -hmm. At work the very related. Least. Yeah. yeah. Work related career. Yeah. Negative interactions with your boss. You never know. Grief and loss. Oh, trauma. Grief. Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah, you're, you're spot on, Rachel. Like what you've had so many different experiences. And if your partner resonates or mirrors one of those negative interactions or experiences, you may go into fight or flight, which we brought up, or you might freeze. And then that triggers your partner. So there's just 
and they didn't even know you had that negative experience. You never even shared exactly. that your dad yeah. slapped you. <laughs> I mean, maybe you never even shared with them that you got put in time out for 10 hours in a corner or in a room. I mean, they don't, you don't share every experience with your partner. You've not remembered everything. Right. Yeah. I find that comes up a lot as in, uh, you know, couples therapy, it's like even just the emotion itself that the person is feeling right. That scared and hurt has yeah. never been verbalized and communicated right between the, the couple before. And so it's new information that's eye-opening for everybody. Mm-hmm. And that's what we love to do. That's when we see yeah. change. That's when they start to tango together. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and yeah, go ahead, Miss Rachel. Sorry. Yeah. Linda and I are, uh, and other emotionally focused therapists are, we're going to, we, we help people kind of process and put together their experience, right? I feel hurt. My chest tightens. I'm afraid you don't love me. Right. And I lash out to protect myself or I withdraw in, into the bedroom and go take a nap. Right. And, and we're going to have you like that person, right. Look at their partner in the eye and share that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because we don't, want you to be relying on us forever to keep this relationship functioning. We're teaching you the skills to communicate and, and do this outside of therapy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that needs to be happening in Mm -hmm. between sessions, not at the beginning, because there's still a lot of conflict, right. But as we move along and there is safety and there's an awareness of the cycle right? And you have the ability to stop the cycle, right? If this doesn't start to happen outside after, you know, a few months, then what are we doing? I- yeah. And that's, that's when self of therapist comes in. We're like, we start hitting blocks and we're like, oh man, I'm just can't get it right for this couple. And I feel like a real failure. Yes. <laughs> it happens. We have to deal with ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's just being honest. And then, you know, we might have the conversation with you guys and say, hey, how, how's this feeling for you guys? What's the temperature like for you when you all leave here? Is it, is it changing? Are you noticing, you know, we're going to check in with you because that's the whole goal of the model. And we so appreciate our listeners, viewers, the people that share our podcast. And Rachel and I are just so grateful for, for all the referrals, the likes, and you guys make us grow. So thank you for that. Yeah. So appreciative. So grateful. Thank you. And so next time we'll come up with something to talk about. (laughs) We always do. Yeah. Yeah. So we appreciate you listening and we, um, we will sign off. Yeah, hopefully this gave some insight on what to expect, what couples therapy isn't and what it is. And we appreciate you for listening. Until next time. Bye. Bye.